will be live going live here shortly. <coughs> open at him, open at him. Hey, I got a toenail, hangnail on my toe. Is that normal? I used to bite them. You, you Did ever, you? Yeah, Kim hates when I bite my toenails. Yeah, you know what? I well, I don't bite my t- I used to. <laughs> we ain't getting our Have feet you tried in that? our mouth anymore. <laughs> Never tried. <laughs> when was the last time you had your toe in your mouth? Uh, I, probably when I was born. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> uh, I'd like to see that. You're listening to Rodney Rogers Outdoors Radio, where we turn it upside down and look at the outside from the inside out. It's safe, it's legal, and we're having a blast. So put your shoes on, my friend, because we're going outdoors. Welcome to Rodney Rogers Outdoors. I am Rodney Rogers. That over there is my partner, Coach Easton Crime. Mike the man himself, Mike Hoy. How are you, brother? I'm ready to be schooled tonight, Rodney. School. Tonight is school tonight. We're going to change up our the way we do things tonight. Uh, but to start off, Mike, how was your weekend? You had a beautiful weekend. Very dangerous. You were living on the edge this weekend. Outdoors. <laughs> but you were, in fact. Playing in traffic. <laughs> Outdoors, you were almost illegally parked. Yes. I would say was... all all weekend long. Man, the weather was phenomenal this weekend. Beautiful weather, man. I Humidity's take... down. Temperatures where it's in the if you're in the sun, it's warm. Yep. It's in the if you want to cool off, get in the shade. Get in the shade. That's exactly right. That's exactly. How right. was it? Thirty feet under the surface. It of the was ocean? real chilly. My toes got numb at some point. Uh, we we did a lot of diving. Uh, my cousin Nick and I did a ton of diving this weekend. We actually went through eight tanks. Between the two of That's us. a lot of diving. Yeah, we went through one on Sunday just looking for a place to dive. Excuse me. And then we went through three Saturday. Well, you were down for a while then. If you went for eight, because you weren't that deep. Right. So you spent, you had a lot of bottom time. Bottom time. Yeah, we could, we you know, being a, a, a 27 foot max, and there was only one spot where it was actually 27 feet. But the majority was anywhere from 15 to 18 feet. Uh, there was a few places that were a little deeper, but we were rarely in those spots. We were... Just enjoy. We wanted to do some spear fishing, um, but what happened is that the, while the weather was beautiful, the wind was crazy. So the wind um, really churn, churns up the water. I mean, it just makes it murky and makes it real bad. Uh, where we dove, they said the week before it was crystal clear. You had thirty foot visibility. We had about five to seven at best, and at most times three to four. So. Um, what we did was we were diving right by the Skyway Bridge. There was a small bridge just before the Skyway, and we, we started there. We wanted to spearfish. We just wanted to get some sheephead, some, but we ended up finding uh, uh, stone crabs. So we had a stone crab checker with us, so we, we, we harvested some stone crabs. That was delish. You cooked them? Oh, my gosh, yes. Really? Oh, Mike. We, we left from the dive straight to the pot. <laughs> really? If I'd have had a pot there, I'd have ate them right there. It wow. Was, it was just super delicious. Uh, and then we got some sheephead. So we flayed those and ate sheephead. And that, that, you sent me a photograph that was uh, sheephead and perch? Yeah, we, we caught the – they were called sand perch. They're actually called moharas. Moharas. They call them sand perch. Uh, we had uh, speared a couple the day before, and we hear that they're mainly used for bait fish, but we filleted it anyway. We ate bait fish. So and it was phenomenal. It was <laughs> great fish taco fish. I mean, and you and there's no limit on those. You can stab them, and yeah. jig them all day. I mean, it was just awesome, awesome. So um, some of the things we found underneath, man, we found 31 cast nets. Wow. Now that's I, I know everybody's like, oh, cool cast nets. No, that's that's really bad. Here's here's what I. Here's the process of that cat, that one cast net being underwater. Nick and I spent a lot of our time digging fish out that were still alive. Now, it's not someone just threw it in there. These things pick things up. So what, here's what happens. A fish gets in there and starts to die. As it dies, a crab comes in to eat on the fish, but he gets wound up in the cast net. So what happens, another fish comes in to eat the crab. And this is a food chain. It's a 
all happened. It's a pile up on the highway. It's a pile up on the highway. That's exactly right. Yeah. Once these crabs get in, we dug, I don't know how many crabs out of, I don't know how many, you know, 30 cast nets. And they were all just full, full. We pulled up what we could. Some of them were buried real far under, wrapped around rocks. We just, we just didn't have time. Yeah. I mean, all of our time would have been spent just, you know, pulling up cast nets. Now, there's a lot of structure, and there's parts of the old Skyway Bridge. There's carts. There's rod and reels. There's <laughs> hundreds of miles of fishing line. Um, Nick was having a problem of this fishing line grabbing his his gear and snapping his weights out. You know the the snap weights that we used yeah. when we were in Isla yeah. Mirada? Literally pull them right out of his pocket. If you get caught on line, he would just try to rip himself loose, and he always lost something. Um, pull our mask off, pull our res- regs out. I mean, it was just a maze. And I'll tell you what, I will not go without that line cutters again. Here's what happened. I was pulling up a cast net. This glove got two hooks from the cast net wow so as i was pulling this glove out to reach over and try to get these hooks out pow two hooks in this one so i was literally stuck inside this cast net with two hooks in each hand and i took my line cutters ring and just swirled it around cut the two fishing lines and on the other one i actually had a metal leader so the line cutters couldn't even cut that so i cut one of the lines had to pull it out to get down to the line and cut it. So I came up with four hooks oh my in my gloves. That's the scary part of pulling up nets. Wow. Imagine no knife. Imagine a knife yeah. with hooks in your hands and you can't get to your knife. Imagine that. So, I mean, there's a lot of – it literally proved itself invaluable for that one instant, literally that one moment. Wow. So, um, man, kudos to the line cutters for that one. Wow. And they didn't even intend it, intend it for that sure. use. And then, you a know, life saving device around your finger. Life saving, Mike. I could Literally, yeah. Yeah, it, it was. That's yeah. awesome. And unfortunately, a lot of it we couldn't film. It was just too murky. Too murky. So, um, so yeah. you did some Christmas shopping while you were down there. We did. We pulled Very up nice. some lures. We pulled up, oh my gosh. I mean, it was just absolute rods and reels. I, I bet we saw 15, 20 rods and reels. Some have been down there for years. Yeah. They're just covered in barnacles. And I wanted to pull one up because it was so covered. I yeah. just wanted it as a wall piece. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Very cool. So uh, that was that was what we did this weekend. I mean, we we just we just grabbed tanks. We went to a dive shop, got tanks, and said, "Let's go find a place to get in the water." That's fun. And that's what we did. And this was advanced diving one hundred and one. I, I certainly wouldn't recommend. Um, now I'm still a novice, I guess, by diving standards. Um, but I, I, Nick and I made sure, you know, we buddied up. We didn't let each other out of sight. It was real heavy moving current, mm-hmm. so it was super dangerous. Yeah. Uh, there was times when we were just totally lost, you know, three-foot visibility, and you're, you know, 50 yards out in the middle of this channel, 27 feet deep. You don't know which way's left or right. You don't know south, north. If it wasn't for that compass on your regulator – you know, that you literally are flying blind. Well, I suppose your temperament is, I mean, your, your temperament is one of, of calm. Yeah. So that, that, that's that, critical. Yeah. That is absolutely you know, critical. And that's a, a lot of experience in, in diving is just that, is learning that calm and absolutely. not panicking. And that's kind of and I'll, instilled into you. And I'll tell you one of the weird feelings is you're down there, you're lost. It's, you got very low visibility, and you hear these big boats coming right over your head, and you look up, and they're about 15 or 20 feet above your head, you know. So it's – it's you know, well, I could just go to the surface and look around and see where I'm at, but you also know that if you go to the surface, odds are they don't see your dive flag, and they're going to hit you right in the head. So yep. that, that's, that's always that scary feeling. So you have to stay calm 27 feet and go, okay, if I go – Two directions will take you out into the ocean, and two directions <laughs> will take you to each wall. Yeah, it's bad when the the boats are running over your your dive flags. You know, that's exactly. I, I, mean, I just solve that. I I just take it down with me. If you leave it up there, they're just gonna hit it. <laughs> they're just gonna run your yeah, dive take, flag. Take over. it down with you when you go back up. Bring that's, it up with you. That's exactly. That's why we said once we get out <laughs> of sight of our dive flag, which was about three feet away. We just stayed at the bottom. Yeah. The key is just stay right at the bottom because, you know, draft of a big boat's three or four feet at max. So we're wow. 25 feet under, so we're safe. Well, and you keep close proximity to each other with that kind of low visibility. and Absolutely. Nikki probably looks better with three feet vis- visibility. <laughs> he does. All right. Yeah, two to three <laughs> feet, he looks <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> so that was my weekend, man. I was Good so happy you, to man. run out 
four tanks of air this weekend. Good I really you. needed that. I've been wanting to dive, and that's just kind of what we got into. Good. So. Well, you had the perfect weekend for it. Absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous weekend. Um, but we've got some viewer mail. We've got some questions. Um, we got some top stories, but. Uh, yeah, you're 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 the captain. I'm the co-pilot. How do you want to head with this? So let's do this. Let's dive right into this topic that we've been trying to dive into. Okay. For three weeks now, this is our third week, and the topic is going to be the red drum assessment. Um, so basically, you found this. Well, I, I like the FWC website, and obviously, I go there for a lot of the news. And the more you dig, the more you find out. And I, I've just learned. I'm, I'm learning every time I go to the website how involved what they're doing is. Absolutely, And, and yeah. you just click on one one link and you go, well, what's that? And a whole other world opens up. Absolutely. And you can just go deeper and deeper and deeper. And the further you go, you realize what the FWC, you just get a glimpse of what they're doing. Right. And so I ran across this thing called, you know, the fish assessment or the red drum fish assessment. and Which is absolutely... Basically, it's what's that. Right. So... Th to me... You know what's funny is it answers a lot of questions. If, if, you're, if you're that person to go, why do we have a limit? Why, why isn't the limit so much more? How do they determine what our limit is or, 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 or what our sizes are? And that's exactly what this does. This tells you what, 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 they, what the predicted death rate is, and, and, and we're going to go through that. This is really the... Um this is really the crutch of management. That's exactly right. Right? I mean, this is this is Absolutely. how they get their information to make these decisions, like you said, on, on limits and how much you can take. And um, and this this goes to what we were talking about when you see that biologist at the boat ramp trying to do a survey. Now, these are just guys getting paid very minimal, and they're only out there a few, few hours of the day, and all they want is your information. Did you fish for redfish? Yes. Box check. Did you catch redfish? Yes. Box check. Did you keep redfish? Yes. But, you know, and, and that's, you know, um, how, how long were they? They were 18, 19 inches. Um, did, you, did you catch more? Well, of course we did. We caught some around 24, 28, blah, blah, blah. And all this information is written down. And it's taken right back to headquarters. And that's how they base our assessments, um, our catch and release, mm -hmm. our, our catch and keep. And it's all based off of that. And that's where these, these come from. And that's done all over the state of Florida. And we've got thousands of miles of shoreline and hundreds of boat ramps, you know, in locations. Yeah, and they this varies between these different regions. Zones. And they, they vary them based on what their what the results are. Correct? Exactly. Exactly. I'm gonna mute this. I was hearing that ding and I was trying to see where it's coming from. And again it's coming from nope, mine's mute. Okay. Mine is muted. What's mute? I thought my hair. I'll mute mine. No, I don't want to mute mine because – oh, you'll tell me if a call's coming, right? Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you. So anyways, but it's – but and then – so I wanted to dig into this one assessment, and this is just red drum. Keep in mind, this is just one fish, one, one species. Fish. Exactly. That, that there's, you know, hundreds or thousands of – I don't know how many they do assessments on, but I just thought it was fascinating. I thought this would be great for Rodney to just kind of walk us through this. Let's look at the charts. Let's look at the facts, the figures. And let's let's and, let's – like you mentioned, this came out three weeks ago, but um, I'm sure th they do this annually. I'm assuming. Well, yeah, yeah. That that it, here it doesn't say how often they do it, but the research is going on every day of the year, every year. I mean, it's it never stops because we always need to know where those numbers are. So we'll just we'll just start out with the the, the state's current regulations. Um, now, in the state of Florida, commercial harvest of redfish is absolutely prohibited. So if you are a commercial fisherman, you cannot sell redfish to restaurants or to anybody. I cannot catch a redfish and sell it to you. I can only catch a redfish and give you a redfish. Okay. Give a man a fish, blah, 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 blah. But give him a redfish. <laughs> give him a redfish. He made a friend for life. He, got, whew, he just started. <laughs> and uh, so... The slot size limit right now is 18 to 27 inches, and that's total length. Now, when I say total length, I mean when you pinch the tail from the nose to a pinch, the end of a pinch tail is total length, not fork length. Okay. Okay? Is that, are we, yeah. that make sense yeah, so yeah. far? Okay. 
Now, we have regional bag limits. Um, the southeast and the southwest um, are one fish per person per day. Now, in the northwest and the northeast is up there by the panhandle. Um, it's two fish per day. Obviously, there are more fish. By assessments, you know, there's a lot more redfish up there. So they're allowed two fish per day. The vessel limit is eight. Now, what I mean by vessel limit is, you know, if there's 15 people on a boat, the vessel can only have eight fish, regardless of what the personal limit okay. is. That's the maximum that vessel can carry. Now, I'm going to pop in a few questions as we go along. Is this Absolutely. Does each species have a vessel, I mean, similar? Yes. Yes. Regulations like yep, this? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, you know, we can even, you know, a couple times a month pick a species and look at that and go over it. Actually, we can just pick the few that are the, we, the snook, the red, you know, okay. and, and those kind of things. But, yes, um, off, off the water possession limit is six per person. Now, I see that look yeah, on your face. So. That means in your house that's off the water. You can have six of these per person in your freezer. Does that make sense? Okay. Or your cooler or something like that. That means you could have six days, if you live in the south, you can have six days worth of fish in your possession. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, now, the commercial harvest <clears throat> and the sale of red drum has been prohibited in the United States, not in the United States, but in the state of Florida since 1989. Because used to, you could buy red, you know, blackened drum, in restaurants. You can't. No you more. cannot anymore. No, you cannot. Because, you know, that, that goes back to commercial. You can't sell it to restaurants. You can't. Not even your own. Yeah. You know, you, you can't do it. So, and there again, it's divided into four segments. Uh, the southwest zone, the southeast zone. Now, where that's going to stretch from, like, Jacksonville all the way down to Miami. And then from Miami all the way up just above Tampa. That's the southeast and the southwest zones. Okay. Um, so all that, that whole run is one fish. One fish per person. So, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry. Oh, let me let me back up. The northeast is from, I'm just trying to look up, from Jackson, uh, from the tip of Florida down just below St. Augustine, it looks like. I'm sorry. That That is two fish. Yes, so let's cut the state in half. The top half is two fish. The bottom half is one fish. Okay. I apologize. It's, it's my bad. Good catch. My bad. So let's talk about the 2015 stock assessment is what they did. Now, I'm going to go over what, what we're talking about. In here, it's going to talk about escapement management goals and then the biological thresholds. Now, remember, I did not write this. So, I don't. you know, that's kind of why we have it here. I have read through this. I know pretty much what it is, so I'm going to try to hit it right on the head. Uh, this is data from, you know, from 2013 to 2015, and what it does is, is it evaluates the status of the stock relative to current management. Now, their goal is 40% escapement, and I'm going to explain to you what the escapement is. It's a key means. phrase. Yes, escapement is the key phrase. Escapement is the percentage of fish surviving through the age Four compared to how many would have survived if there was no fishery. Does that make sense? Say that again. So it's the percentage of fish surviving to four years old okay. compared to how many fish would have survived if there was no management period. So basically okay. what they're saying is if there was no management, how many fish would have survived? So it's the effectiveness it's the of what they're doing. That's exactly okay. right. So they have a biological threshold, which means if we don't mess with these things, their bi biological threshold okay. is 20%. We wanted – their goal is 40% escapement. Now, that includes catch and release, how many die from the release. You know, you take 35 pictures, you get the fish back in the water, and he goes belly up. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If he's not – if he's an yeah. over-the-limit fish, the key is to take that picture, get it back in the water as fast as you can – hold the fish correctly, revive it, and most people think they hold the mouth of the fish open. A fish cannot breathe with its mouth open. Its gill, his mouth has to be closed, and his gills are what processes the oxygen. It has nothing to do with the mouth. Does that make sense? Yeah. They use their mouth to eat. Their gills does all the breathing. So 
gills open, pulls in water, they close, they process that. It's just like us taking a deep breath. So you holding the mouth open is not doing anything but hurting that fish. They can't process. It's moving the water over them so fast they can't they can't well wow. uh, um, absorb the oxygen. Okay. So proper method: take your pitcher, get it back in the water. You have a lot of old timers that have these old myths about driving with the mouth open. You know, no, that's mm. that's that's, that's that's the old way of doing things. So. The more we learn, the better escapement that we have, and we can reach that threshold. So they've set 40% as their mark for as success. Exactly. That, that's where they went. They went 40% or better yep. of effectiveness of what they're doing. Of effectiveness of what they're doing. <clears throat> escapement management goal. And what was the one right underneath that? Was that? Now, that's the biological threshold. This is where if we didn't do anything, we didn't mess with these fish, we didn't catch them, they died from natural causes, they died from, okay. you know, young they died from, sure. you know, a uh, hundred other thousand reasons. So that's their uh, biological threshold, which is this, um, which is a, a s estimated to occur at 20% escapement. The biological threshold indicates the population level at which the sustainability of the stock is expected to, to be threatened. So if this got down to 20%, then the spe you know, that species would be considered threatened. Okay. Okay. Sure. So half of what we're, what our goal is would be a threatened species. So the population should be sustainable at a rate of escapement of about 20% sustainable. The commission has chosen to manage red drum for abundance due to its social and economic importance. That's going to be a key here in a second. Um, as one of the state's most popular sport fisheries. So we have snook, redfish, trout, our, our state's, Inner waters or our inner coastal waters are it's their main bread and butter. Okay. People come all over the world to fish for that. Because there's no redfish up in Maryland, Maine, you know, and all the, the coast, you know, it, it goes up to North Carolina, I think, is about the so they're taking care of it and they want that high goal because they have a lot of fish. So I don't think that this thing says this, and I'm gonna go ahead and say it. Um, f redfish, and now here we go. Let me just, I'm going to personally, uh, the males, the, the females are productive. Um, ooh, okay. That slot of 18 to 27 inches is when that fish is its least productive. Okay. They're not ready to spawn and or produce okay. you, you know what i'm saying right, right so that's the slot so the fish that you are taking out in that that is that 18 to 20 inches this is the least productive fish is the least productive fish once they reach over that 27 inch threshold then they're very productive so we're keeping the productive fish in the management program is, is that yeah so we're keeping the ones that are actually able to produce and we're taking the ones that aren't because if we do that the opposite way around, then we'll get down to that 20% biological threshold. Now, I'm not trained by the FWC to go through this. I'm, you know, I'm reading this and that. Yeah, and this is, and for for those listening or, or watching, this is a PDF straight off the FWC website. That's exactly right. I found right. it fascinating, and I, and and things like, um, I'll scroll down a little bit, Rodney. Okay. I'm, I just wanted to get my terminology. Where? No, I scroll down. Oh, up. Uh, escapement management Escape, goal. Yes. Things like that I knew you could explain to me because I'm trying to make sense of this. But Right, that's exactly. So that's that's our escapement goal. So we're doing nothing more than literally walking through this PDF tonight because I thought exactly it would be right. very interesting. That is different. absolutely right. <clears throat> okay, so now this is, uh, uh, this is an assessment that they're going to do for every fish. And this is, again, back to the beginning, this is why um, we show us now – I'll tell you, these are the graphs. Uh, where I'm at now is, are the graphs. I will go ahead and admit I am colorblind. I cannot tell that top graph from the bottom graph. I, to me, this is, no matter how much I zoom it in, oh, right. they have colors and that, escapement that's is a the challenge. operative word <laughs> okay. here. It, it just escapes me. Uh, but what these graphs point out is over time, over the years, where these, these, these dips and uh, the valleys of the, the most productive areas uh, before being managed aggressively in the 1980s escapement rates were well below the escapement goal of 30 percent 
Now, it was 30% in the 1980s. However, these rates increased rapidly in response to strict regulations placed on red drums in the mid, excuse me, in the mid 1980s. So, once they realized that commercial fishing was putting a real damper on this, and if we had commercial fishing on this fish today, we would be struggling to hold this fish in existence. Hmm. Uh, Because now we got things like the brown tide that's happening in one of the largest redfish fisheries in the world, you know. So it's they're they're being hurt, and this was obviously done before all the red tide. Um, Although the the escapement rate varies among management zones, it has been consistently exceeding the management goals in the northeast and northwest. That's why they have the the two fish limit. Okay. So the plan has worked so brilliantly that it exceeds their limit. So, you know, we have two fish limits up there. <clears throat> uh, in the southwest zones, since the late 1980s, so the southwest management zone has been generally more variable than the other zones. And I know this, this is, sounds kind of confusing. I'm hoping to break it down for you. Um, uh, than the other zones that did not consistently, consistently meet the commission's management goal for 2000 to 2008. However, according to 2015 assessments, now you can tell that they've been doing this since the 80s. Right. This this assessment yeah. has been going on consistently for the eight, since the 80s. Um, uh, Southwest Zone has also exceeded the management goal every year since 2008. Are you ready for this? Average over the last three years, the assessment escapement rates were 66, 68, 58 and 48 percent in the northwest, southwest, and northeast and southeast zones, respectively. Wow. So your lower 58 and 48 percent are down in the lower southeast and southwest zones, but your 66 and 68 percent escapement um, survival rate that they're looking for is well above their expectations. And that's why we have a two fish limit in those areas. I almost feel like a teacher here. I was. You are. Feel like <clears throat> so uh, the next graph we're talking fish mortality. Okay. Um, now, now when they bring out fish mortality, we're talking harvesting and release mortality, and that's what I was talking about earlier. What we're talking about is when we catch that fish and we take our pictures and we release it. I'll tell you, out of all the fish I've caught, there's a few that are real fragile on the release, and redfish is one of them. Really? Yes. I don't know what it is. But they are very finicky. Uh, a couple reasons. One is is a lot of people use live baits. The hooks get nailed down deep. They try to fish them out. I, I would not recommend if it's down deep, clip the line, go. Believe it or not, they do very well with the hook still in them. Well, salt water will dissolve it too, right? Absolutely. Or is that a myth? No, no. It's, it's 100%. Yeah. I picked up tons of lures this weekend that had absolutely no hooks on them. They were okay. just laying on the bottom of the ocean. Okay. The hooks were completely gone. So uh, does it, I don't know the exact uh, deterioration rate. God, that's a big word, man. Did I just sound like do, Yeah, do it again. Uh, I don't know the exact deterioration rate. That, that's really good. <laughs> Dude. Your enunciation is impeccable. It's, it's just I, I, sometimes I impress myself. So, Mike, I really don't. So... <laughs> The word enunciate, just I need to figure out where to use that one. Um, so the estimates from the 2015 stock assessment, fish mortality is calculated as the total of fish harvest plus the fish that do not survive release. For further explanation, see, this goes now this is goes back to the charts. Now, if you guys can see these charts, which I can, I just, there's no color here. So I think we're, we're in good shape here. So. Here's where these biological assessments at the boat ramp become. It is not illegal to release a fish and it go belly up. There's just nothing wrong with that. It's it's nature. It's going to happen. So if you get to that ramp, uh, it's not like it's a trap. That's you know, a that's a good point. It, yeah, it, it's 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 you're only helping us by saying I released a fish. It went belly up. It was 28 inches long. It was over the limit. You know, it's not illegal to catch them. It's illegal to harvest them. Okay. You know, these fish, sometimes they go belly up. Uh, we were right off the Port Canaveral, and we had a 40-inch redfish that, that was I was trying to revive that someone released, had a hook way down deep in him, and it was mm-hmm. just revival was just 
It's just not going to happen. Wow. So, <clears throat> you know, it's just one of those things. You know, it happens. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot harvest those. You know, even if we find them dead, you know, a little flop to them, as bad as we want to fillet them, we can't. Oh, wow. You know, so um, that, that's where they go mortality rate. So we need to know from the fishermen. And the only way they can get this information is from the fishermen. So when you get something from the FWC and they say, hey, you know, give us a little – um, an idea of how you did, you know, what you catch, how long were they, what you release, you know, that's that's the key. Give them that information. Uh, it's only going to help us. Yeah, and they're only going to be able to really touch base with a small wedge of, of the fishing popular community, right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, so, you know, anything you can do voluntarily to, to say, hey, you know, here's what we did. It's only going to help, you know, us. Um, so now we're going to go to catch per unit effort from 1982 to 2014. So, man, that's, that's a hard one to see. Um, basically, what they have here is catch per angler per hour. So we have it starting out kind of in 1982, um, you know, uh, regional catch per unit effort, 1982 to 2014. F- 14. 2014. Um, let me see. I, I had those numbers down. So let me go back up here. So as we can see by the chart, if if everybody's seeing the chart that I'm seeing. They are. Uh, the, the key is the increase. I had the numbers in my head, and, and we are literally, you know, you're talking 1982, and you can see that per hour the catch rate was super Super low. We're talking uh, unbelievably low. And we're talking maybe a half of, you know, less than a fish per hour. And now we're up to two per hour 15 years later. Uh, and it's it's fluctuated through that whole time. So, um, and, and the chart has just exponentially increased since. So it's it's been kind of an up and down, and it's interesting to see the the variances between the different quadrants there. That's exactly right. Your northeast, you know, yeah, because um, if you look, uh, your south your southwest is your lowest consistent, you know, consistently lowest rate there. And this is why, this is why, this is why, yeah. <laughs> why you're going to have different. Um, Limits you see them change east That's coast, exactly west right. coast, north because they're trying to balance this out. They're looking at charts like this. And if you see these charts and you notice that the other three zones are pretty much on the rise, the southwest because it's it's a lot less incorporated than the rest of these. It could be just not enough information coming in because what's happening is not enough fishermen are reporting what they're seeing, what they're catching. Exactly. So they yeah. can only go by what we tell them. Yeah. So when you have a situation like that, it'll the, the limit, as bad as we want to, will never raise sure. because they're not getting that information. Mm-hmm. If they see low numbers like this, they're not just going to arbitrarily go out there and go, okay, let's raise the limits. We got low numbers. No, they need to hear from us to say, hey, we got, you know, I don't, I don't know where you're getting your stats, but we're catching 15 fish a day, yeah, you know, per person, yeah. per hour, you know, whatever the case may be. So this is where those, bio, you know, those, biologists sitting at the bank um absolutely and i've seen some people get really ugly with these guys so the key to this chart is as you can see on the northwest northeast and the southeast zones that is has increased exponentially over the years and then the southwest zone is actually by the looks of it have decreased so uh from the 80s so it could be just a lack of information Hmm. Uh, now, the guy who actually wrote this up and gave the class may have something different to say, but I, I doubt very sure. I think he's, you know. I'm, he didn't I'm, show up tonight, so. Yeah, he didn't show up tonight. So we're going we're gonna to give it our all. So fishery independent monitoring data for, for young of the uh, data for young of year through 2014. Okay, so this is the um, start date um, variability between regions is due to length of time uh, has been monitoring. So this is basically – Indicates the age of the fish. Now, remember, the only way to tell these ages of these fish is the olive bone that is inside the skull. So only one way to get that olive bone, and that's to harvest the fish. So uh, a lot of times you'll see snook. You'll see a cooler by the by the cleaning tables at, at a lot of boat ramps, uh, most popular mm. boat ramps. Sebastian is one. Uh, uh, remember the big cooler yeah, that yeah, was yeah. there? 
Uh, and they'll put what kind of species, you know, species to put in that cooler, and it'll be a cooler of ice. And they'll say, please put your snook carcass in here. Um, so when you do, what they do is they, they harvest. Uh, if the stomach's still there, they look at what the fish ate, and then they pull that olive bone out, and that gives them an exact age of that fish within, wow. a, within a few months. Wow. So, and that's basically what these charts are doing. Um, and what you're seeing here is over the years we're getting, you know, uh, a, a ton of juvenile fish. So these are there again in that southwest zone. You see it just basically, you know, uh, half-year-old fish are right across the bottom. They're not very old fish. So th that also will tell us what the mortality rate is. If we're finding a consistent number of young fish, that means the mortality rate for the larger fish are a lot higher. Yeah. So uh, this is there, that, that research okay. that they can uh, deduct. Deductive reasoning is what I would call it. You know, we're seeing these young fish. Where are the old fish? Where are the older fish, the three-, four-year-old fish? And you can see there's just not that many. So <clears throat> and in our other zones, it's a variable that we can see here that it's it, there again. Proper management gives us that, that fluctuating rate. Now, uh, cold temperatures can... Uh, the, can raise the mortality rate of redfish and snook. Uh, redfish are a little more resilient than snook. So, yeah, like I said, I'd like to see this chart. So we're doing very well with the exception of the southwest zone. Uh, there again, we, it could be just an information. Hmm. Now, sub-adult, um, abundance through 14, uh, 2014, data from juvenile fish through 2014 um, between the regions – uh, due to the length of time, uh, has been monitoring at different sites around the state. Now, this could be, and a, a lot of this data could be only three or four boat ramps that we're getting. You, you know what I mean? Right. So, um, there might be one area th that they're pulling the information from that just normally doesn't have a lot of fish and a lot of report rate. So, th that's what we're getting here. Here, we're saying, now, if you can see that these juvenile fish, a little bit, from you know the first one was from zero to three. This one's um, uh, just below the year old mark. These fish are below the year old. So what they're saying is in the southwest zones, if you look at the age of these fish uh, compared to the northwest zone, where the fish seem to be a little older on the harvest. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, your top left there, uh, you see the northwest zone. You see that the average of fish up there are anywhere from just at a year old to just under two years old. And then in the southwest zone, we're, we're all under the juvenile fish. We're all under that, that year mark. Nothing is over a year, as well as the other zones in that yeah, same that's interesting. category. So <clears throat> there again. If yeah, in the northwest, the scale on the left-hand side is totally different. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And you can see that the reporting um, are less years of reporting. You know, they've skipped yeah. a few years yeah. in the northeast zone. Hmm. But you can still see the chart movement. And it's, there again, it's up and down. Depending on – that goes back to the mortality chart, harvest, um, yeah. you know, natural mor mortality and, and that kind of thing. So let's uh, – how are we doing here, Mike? Sorry, I'm just pushing through this. I no, wanna, that's fine. I, I mean, want to get to the end of this there, thing and, and still. So so what, what we have at the end, we have what's called the summary assessment results. So basically, this is what people want to know. All right, Rodney, what have we come to? What's, what's this mean? Yeah. What's this mean to us? So uh, basically what it's saying is Florida red, red, Florida's red drum stock is healthy. And the results are through 2013 indicate that all management zones – are, number one, not overfished and not experiencing overfishing from what they can tell from the data that we've received. All of our zones are exceeding the 40% escapement management goal that they have. Put. Now, will that move to 50% next year? Who knows? Right. I don't think it will. I think this is a comfort zone. Fish are doing very well. Um, in the northeast zone, the recent downward trend, in, you know, there's a small recent downward trend in escapement. The southeast zone is generally lower escapement rates uh, than other regions. But, you know, it's still doing well. And that includes the Indian River yeah. Lagoon. Um, the preliminary 2014 data supports trends reported in this assessment. So 
What they're saying is up to 2013, we're doing fantastic. They're already starting their data runs for, you know, since 2014. And what it's saying is so far it's looking good. Right. You know, we're still in great shape. Yeah. Uh, let's, you know, now 2016, 2017 assessment may be a little different now that we've got the brown tide. So that'll be something interesting to, to, to keep on. So based on the results of 2015 red drum stock assessment, Florida's red drum stock is healthy. The biomass estimates that uh, fishing mortality estimates indicate that red drum are not overfished and not, not being currently overfished, just like I just said. <clears throat> While the results of 2015 assessments are very positive, there are some indications that, um, that continue to close monitoring for these f- fishery is appropriate. So they need to close monitor these things because certain aspects. And this was a 2015 assessment. So what we're going to see is the 2016 to 2017 assessment. 2017 assessments because of this brown tide is going to affect this count. That would be interesting. Yeah. So it may come it might down be sad, to but it might be interesting. Exactly. It may come down to zero harvest in that southeast zone. It, we could go from one fish harvest to zero in the southeast zone. Might go for to zero, but still have the yeah the mortality rates be higher, you know. You know, and, and a lot of people don't know this, but you can catch redfish offshore. And if you catch redfish offshore in federal waters, regardless of the size, you can't harvest them, period. Oh, really? Even when it's in the legal limit, okay. you cannot harvest it in, in the Atlantic federal waters. So, um, you know, it's important. This this fishery, this these assessments are basically absolutely fragile. And I mean absolutely fragile. Uh, factors to consider. Assessment results indicate consideration of a one fish bag limit um, may be warranted in northeast zone. So basically what they're saying, it very well could go down to one fish in the northeast zone where it's two fish now. Uh, stakeholder comments prior to assessment completion indicate the fishery is good. Uh, some panhandle angers have expressed concern regarding the fishery in that area. So... It's good that the anglers are saying, look, we're not seeing as many. Yeah. You know, let's um, let, let's figure this out. You don't want to fish yourself out. There's a it's lot good. of commerce off of, you know, guides and such that. Um, so, therefore, the staff is recommended gathering additional public input regarding stakeholder observation and concerns related to the red drum fishery. So, basically, what they're saying is we need help. There's just not enough people in the FWC to be everywhere at once. Um, I think the question is, is maybe I'll plunder through and see if there's a voluntary form that the FWC would like you to fill out. I don't know. It's just in my head. Is there one? Um, We'll see. Maybe I'll send out a few emails. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tony Young, our buddy up there, could probably point us in the direction of who to talk to for that. You know, Rodney, you want to talk to this guy, and then I'll talk to that guy and see if we can't get maybe something pointed in that direction. So, uh, <clears throat> trying to th- oh, well, that's it right there. Okay, next steps. Staff, the staff will continue to gather public input input on the red drum fishery uh, update and progress on stakeholder engagement uh, at April Commission meeting in Jupiter. So they're having a meeting this this April, or actually this month. So and and, of course, they'll always post those results. So we'll get to see those and see, okay, Good. what's going to happen. And I got a feeling we're going to see a big change um, because of the brown tide. Yeah. Uh, it, it's going to be definitely, definitely a, um, a, a big deal. So it'll be something really interesting to keep a watch on, <clears throat> most definitely. Because they, they do this asses- assessment with snook, and uh, right now it's red snapper. Red snapper is the big deal uh, because – we don't have a lot of input from mm-hmm. anglers. Mm-hmm. That is a fish that is commercially fished, and it's a fish that we, we cannot commercial fish and or, I mean, we, we have a very limited snapper season here. For several years, we weren't allowed to keep them at all. And now you can't drop your hook without catching a snapper, and you can't even get to the other fish because the snapper are biting it so fast. So, you know, but it's a deep water fish, so it's hard to tell the mortality. It's hard yeah. to do these studies on those. Unless you're underwater 24-7. Yeah. So it's, it's – this fishing stuff is a, it's a big a, deal. Well, it, it, it's a big deal. There's a lot of information there. And number one, you got to appreciate the fact that FWC is doing it. 
And it also points to the fact that there's a, there's a lot going on. That's why when we read these law enforcement things every week, that's why there's pages and pages, pages. and pages of people finding them in situations either because they're simply being stupid and breaking the law and doing things they should they know they shouldn't they be doing. They know they shouldn't be doing. Or finding themselves in situations. They just didn't know. There, there's so many parameters here. Right. Uh, you, you, we, you know, your goal is to make it easy and get people out and fishing. But there's a side of it you got to be educated, right. too. Yeah. And as you said, keep me safe. Yep. Keep me legal. <laughs> you know, and... Make- Take, make me king for a make day. Make me king for a day, yeah. exactly. So the, and, and that's our goal. And that's where this red drum, I, I was actually excited to read this thing because it, it put in perspective what I had speculated because I didn't know for sure of why they keep these fish, you know, in that non-productive range. I just, knowing redfish or yeah. knowing the fishery, I, it just made sense to me. Yeah. You know, and it just it verified some of the facts that I knew in my head that I that I guessed. I'm not going to lie. I guessed it. And then when I read through this, I go, oh, okay. Yeah. And that's my guess was correct. Um, it's kind of a common sense thing, you know. It, it really does make for some interesting reading, though. I mean, to dig oh, through absolutely. that. Like I say, just start clicking on things on the FWC website. There's all kinds of valid yes. current information and stuff. Stuff that's fascinating, interesting, but a lot of stuff that you need to know. You will bogger you know? your mind yeah. with that information. Yeah, if you're a fisherman, you, you need to poke around in there because you'll find stuff that's uh, valid for what you're doing this weekend. That is absolutely 100% right. So, uh, I think the bottom line is choose a fish, you know, and, and choose. Uh, I'm going fishing this weekend. I want to target a fish. Well, let's let's figure out what you're targeting and let's just go from there. And if it's redfish, you know, poof, they're great. They're great stock. Stock assessments up. Everything's great. It isn't. Yeah, it's kind of the state of the union address when it comes to to redfish. Absolutely, um, absolutely. It's it's the biggest one of the biggest commerce fish. If you, if you looked up YouTube on Florida redfish, and you're going to see a million videos. But I think it makes a difference the fact that it's not commercially fished. That makes it a little more that makes att- attractive, all the right? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. It, your success rate, and, and that's what it boils down to. What's our success rate on red fishing? Uh, so, you know, if, if it's first time red fishing, you want to know, I can go out there and actually catch yeah. one. Th- that's the key, you know, and, and you can are they good? Are they good to eat? Oh, my Redfish? God. Are, my f- are they really? Are they tougher? Or? Well, no. Well, here's – and I've said it a million times. Redfish is my least favorite of all fish. Okay. But I cooked it again. The, other, the, the fish that you and I caught, right. I cooked it, and um, and I shot some video, so I need to put all that together. It's, it's a big mishmash of cooking. I uh, made it way too long, but my God. I good, forgot how good redfish good was. Good stuff. Really? Okay. It's, 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 yeah, I don't it's, think I've ever had it. It's absolutely delicious. I did it in four different flavors, so to speak. I did a blackened uh, Cajun, and I did a lemon pepper, and then I just did a just a sea salt and ground pepper. You know, just kind of, and oh my gosh. Well, you realize this is episode 113, right? We've mm-hmm. been doing this for, um, what? 113. Two years. That's over, solid. Over two years. Yes, that's solid over two years. And I, I almost... Um, hesitate to say that maybe for the last year consistently except for some technical difficulties every tuesday night from 8 p.m to 9 p.m we're here we almost have not missed one right that's yeah so so not to call anybody out but the the person in your life who Uh really should know that from 8 p.m to 9 p.m you're doing this every tuesday night yes just called you on your phone i know dude (laughs) <laughs> the main Nick, man that Nick, I died Nick, with? Nick Huckabee? Yeah. What is wrong with you? I'm not even sure he even... <laughs> Mike, I don't even know how to... He's obviously not watching the show. Oh, exactly, that's my point. Yeah, yeah. Not... I'm, not even, I'm not even sure he still follows you on Facebook. <laughs> I know. <I'm> just... <laughs> he don't even know what we're talking about him. We could actually plot his oh, murder oh, right now, right Mike, Public. and he would never know it. All he had to do was listen to the show. He didn't know where not to be. Come Tuesday night, oh, they're gonna kill me right here. Oh, I'm dead. I need to not answer my call again. <laughs> He's behind you with a crowbar. <laughs> so, Mike, I was glad we got through this assessment. I was afraid we wouldn't squeeze. I know I blurbed it all. No, that was that's I'm, good I'm, stuff, though. I just I really wanted nothing more than that than to just read through that PDF good, with you good, and have good. you yeah. break some of the things out, you know? I was excited to read it, honestly, when you found it. You I read like, very well, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I try to... It's very impressive. Yeah, I, I came out with some big words that most people... <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Todd says Nick's special guest. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he is very special. Very special. <laughs> so special if, if you're breed. going out He's for redfish. He's a red special fish, breed. <laughs> That's uh, Mike. What else we have time for? We actually ended with a little time, man. That's good. What do you want to do, man? Do we got viewer mail? We got viewer mail. Well, let's hit it, man. Let's hit it. Let's do some viewer mail. Let's Here we do. Go. You've got mail. Letters. We get letters. We get stuff. Oh yes, wait a minute, Mr. Postman. Send me an email with all the details. Another freaking email. Another freaking email song. Mail time. That's my favorite time, man. I, every time we don't do that, you realize I get texts. Hey, you didn't do mail. Good. Let's keep it going. <laughs> Rodney, here's one for you from Travis from Lakeland, Florida. Travis says... Hang it on, Travis. I fish creek beds during the spawning season. I can see the male and female swimming together, but they aren't interested in any of my baits. Any thoughts? Yes. They are not interested because they are not eating. Um, the key is, once you, here's what you need to do. There's a couple ways to do this. One is, when you see them, record that time. And when I say record the time, I mean, what time of year was it? Was it uh, January, February, March? What was the water temperature? That is your key. Find something to take that water temperature. They make these little scales you just toss in the water, and it tells you depth and water temperature because pressure is what allows the water to go into this little tube. Okay. So the pressure, it opens accordingly. Okay. The deeper, the more the valve opens. Sure. So water temperature is the key. Florida bass will spawn between 55 to 65 degrees. More between toward the 60, 65 degree range. So that's going to be the key. So if your water is 55 to 60 degrees, these fish are going to feed up before they get on the bed because once they're on the bed, their eating is done. Mm. So that's where these big fish come up, come from during that time of the year. They're feeding up, going to spawn, so they're big and fat, and they get ready to spawn. Now, once they are on the bed, the only way to get them out of there is they get mad. You drop a bait in their bed, a soft plastic, white, really bright that you can see. It doesn't matter what it is. They're going to try to move it out of the bed. Now, I watched our buddy Russ Rollins pull some, you know, fishing the other day. He was fishing beds, and he was just, the fish was carrying it out, and he didn't think the fish was eating it. Mm. Once that fish puts it in his mouth, eating or not, it's in his mouth, set to hook. That's the key. That's the key to bed fishing. Uh, many and millions of dollars have been one off springtime bed fishing. You know, so that's the key. Put it in their bed, aggravate them. Just keep aggravating them. Now, is it key the fact that he says, I can see the male and female uh, swimming together? Yeah, th I mean, that, that means they're spawning. They're spawning. Yeah, okay. that means that it is spawning time. Okay. So the, the male is the one that cleans the bed. The, the female will then come and lay her eggs. She will then move off to feed again, and the male guards the eggs. That's just hmm. that's fish life. <laughs> that's the birds that's and the That's just how fishes. they do it. That's the birds and the bees. Okay. So I got the fishies out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rodney. Uh, let's see. Who we got? Uh, Donnie. Donnie, come on. Donnie, Altamont Springs, Florida, right up okay. the road here. Uh, when using a cheap fish finder. Cheap? Cheap fish finder. How do I know if the images of the fish on the screen are actually fish and of what species? Um, look at their eyeballs. No, you don't. <laughs> it could be a floating <laughs> stick in the water. It's just picking up something in the table. So it, it, when it picks something up, it just shows on your screen as a little fishy. So you don't know what it is. And, and, it, and most inexpensive, uh, because to say cheap, most inexpensive fish finders will just give you three sizes of fish. Small, medium, and large. So the bigger image that it that you know that it can pick up, because remember it shoots a radar or a sound wave down. Sure. And depending on how fast it gets back to the transducer, is determines the depth of what you see. So if the water's six feet deep and it's picking something up at, you know, three feet, then it's probably they're saying it's probably a fish. It could be a floating piece of grass. Could be anything. So you really don't know unless you get into the high dollar equipment. 
and then you can actually see the sonars and the you know the big deals. Well, I was going to ask that: is there um, as you go up in price? Yes. Do are you able to tell more information about the fish that you're yes, seeing? Absolutely, absolutely. You can get on structure. Um, pretty much know that. But depending on how the sonar comes back. It's because it's giving you a more uh, detailed imagery? Absolutely. Okay. The imagery is impeccable. Okay. I mean, you just seen that a guy picked, found a car. This was on uh, Outdoor Hub. Found a car, and he reported it to the local police department. And it was a guy that had ran in there had been missing for 30 years. Really? He was still in the car. And he said, it's about time y'all got here. <laughs> <laughs> so I was about to go down. Rodney, I'm not believing you. But, yeah, they actually found the car, and they found the guy. And, yeah, wow. they, they found this. Obviously, they found the skeleton. Yeah. Uh, tag was still carved. And he found it from a sonar fish finder because when his sonar came back up, he goes, that's a car. <laughs> that is a car. Wow. He looked right at his depth finder, and you could see plainly that it was a car. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's these things get real detailed. So. Wow. Um. Talk real quick about that gator video we watched. Okay, yes, yes, yes. Let's talk about that. That's I wanted to, yeah, our top news was, so I got tagged, you know, when something like that pops up, I get tagged in a thousand. Oh, I bet, I bet yeah, you do. It's, 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 it's unbelievable. If I didn't approve everything that went on my Facebook, I'd have that up there 300 times. So basically what it is, this guy is fishing. Now, I don't know where he's fishing. I'm going to speculate that he's in either South Georgia, Louisiana. He's not in Florida because yeah. Tell me why he's catfishing, uh, and he has catfish buoys, which is basically they just float and they bob, and you can't do that in Florida. You don't have those in Florida, but in those other states, your buoy has to be indicated with your name, your number, you know. So, um, I speculate he's either in Louisiana or the very south tip of Georgia, North Florida kind of area there. So he's not in the state of Florida, and he's pulling up his catfish thing, and he goes, I think we got a big gar. And what chilled, what gave me the chills is his son, his little, or son or daughter, I can't yeah. tell what it is behind him. You see this little bitty arm reach out to help him with the buoy. And he goes, no, no, I got it. Don't worry about it. So he pulls us up, and here comes the snout of this huge, and I mean huge alligator. By my calculations i'm gonna say that's probably a 12 foot plus alligator so that is a giant alligator by any standards and he pulls it up and the alligator comes up with his mouth open right at the kayak man that could have went a thousand different ways and i'll tell you what had that alligator had that water not been that murky it would have went a thousand it would have went the worst way possible why is that the only reason that gator did not lunge and bite and start freaking out is because the water was so murky the alligator has no depth okay. perception okay you know what i mean the snout never touched the kayak that saved him there so the gator had no clue it's like bringing them up at night they're not really they're sure they're not really sure you know where you are in relation to them okay if those eyeballs would have surfaced that would have been a whole nother video, I assure you. Wow. I assure you. Wow. Only by experience, I know that if those eyeballs would wow. have been, uh, if they would have broke that surface, I mean, who knows what we would have saw at that point. The video would have been from the other guy <laughs> that wow. was with him. So, yeah, that's definitely a scary situation. And, of course, everybody goes, you know, what, well, Rodney, what would you do? What would you do? I said, I, I would have done exactly what he did. Drop that book. I accept I would have shut my mouth. He just yelled out, oh, it's a gator. Hot dang, it's a gator. <laughs> I would have been very quiet, and I would just softly let go of that buoy and let him sink yeah. down, because the you you seen what gators yeah. do when you yell, yeah. you know they explode. Yeah, I mean they get they freak out. Yeah. they go oh my god, and you know and they could have easily tipped that kayak with that. You know I just thought about that child being in there, and man, that made me sick to my stomach. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, and then and, and then what I posted is look, the gator's marked. He's got a buoy on him that floats. Yeah, so take the kid back to shore. <laughs> <laughs> Go get your catfish buoy. Game you know, on, yeah. Game, and from then, you know, it's it's like, okay, it's time to. Yeah, that's a good point. Take time to get busy because he ain't going in. We know where he's at yeah. at all times. So, yeah, that's. That, that's a good point, yeah. Very, very he's trippy marked. video. Um, he did the exact thing he should have did. You know, you're not getting that hook. Or just cut the line and let the gator have the hook. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> that's, you know, that's probably one of the best. But you got to get that close to it. You know, that's that's a scary video. Yeah. Yeah, impressive. Wow. As a man, as a monster, 
a massa. <laughs> well, we're about out of time Mike, again, Rodney. Thanks for that. thanks for doing the red drum assessment well, with man, me. Well, man, I'm glad you found it, brother. And and I, I like the format where we just go right into the topic. Sometimes we have to. And then, what? Then we talk. Then we about play it later. Out. Get then the work we, done first. Let's, then let's we play a little bit later. Get the meat and taters out of the way, yeah, and for then sure. go from there. So, uh, real quick, we have a our concealed weapons class nailed for the 23rd, which is not this coming weekend. It's the following weekend. Um, email us. Ooh, coffee. Wow. Sorry about that. I'll get it. Email us at Rodney at Rodney Rogers Outdoor. Hit us up on Facebook. Shoot us a message. Give us a call on the 262-345-7763 hotline. Um, we'll get you taken care of. We'll get you signed up for the class. We just need your info. Who's going to be in the class? It is Saturday, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Is that right? Uh, I think that's right. I think that's correct. Yes. Um, you will get – port. we are going to do the class. You're going to be certified to get your CWPs, and we're going to feed you dinner. We're going to feed you some of the best <laughs> Porky's barbecue ever. It will be at the phenomenal Oak Ridge Gun Range, one of my favorite gun ranges. Um, so definitely come see us. Cool. Or uh, send us an email. You got anything else? I don't. Right. As my mama said 18 million times, and I pray I get to say it half as much. Thank you, Mom. I love you. You kids get outside and stay. <laughs>